and welcome to Books of Blood. My name is John, and today for Horror Across America, we are going to be traveling to three, count them, three states. We're going to be doing the news, if you want to say it that way, uh, which means we're going to be doing New Hampshire, uh, New Jersey, and New Mexico. Uh, I'm saving New York for a completely separate video because... It's going to be a pretty big one because who does anything small in New York, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. First off, we're going to do New Hampshire, and I've got seven books for the state of New Hampshire. First one we're going to talk about is Horns, and this is by Joe Hill. Marin Williams is dead, slaughtered under unexplicable circumstances, leaving her beloved boyfriend, Ignatius Parrish, as the only suspect. On the first anniversary of Marin's murder, Ig spends the night drunk and doing awful things. When he wakes the next morning, he has a, has a thunderous hangover and horns growing from his temples. Ig possesses a terrible new power to go with his terrible new look a macabre gift he intends to use to find the monster who killed his lover. Being good and praying for the best got him nowhere. Now it's time for revenge. It's time the devil had his due. And that is Horns, and that is by Joe Hill. Uh, Horns is one of the ones that Joe Hill wrote. I read Horns. I really enjoyed Horns. Uh, and I enjoyed um, the one he did. Uh, well, he did 20th Century Ghost. He did Horns. Um, heart-shaped box. I enjoyed that because I felt like Joe Hill had Joe Hill's voice. You know, but then with stuff like Nosferatu or Nosferatu or NOS4A2 or whatever you want to call it, he started to sound more like his dad, and of course everybody knows his dad is Stephen King, so there you go. Uh, and I hope he gets back to having his own voice because we already have one Stephen King. We don't need two Stephen Kings. And my cat is prowling around back here. He tried jumping on my lap a while ago, and he missed, and he's a little embarrassed. All right, so that's that's Horns. That is by Joe Hill. All right, next up. I have heard so many good things about this book. I really, I do, I need to read this book. Uh, so, like I said, these recommendations are not just for you, but they're for me as well. Uh, the Auctioneer by Joan Sampson. In the isolated farming community of Harlow, New Hampshire, where life has changed little over the past several decades, John Moore and his wife Mim work the, work the land that has been in his family for generations. But from the moment the charismatic Pearly Dunsmore arrives in town and starts soliciting donations for his auctions, things begin slowly and insidiously to change in Harlow. As the auctioneer carries out his terrible, inscrutable plan, the Moors and their neighbors will find themselves gradually but inexor inexorably stripped of their possessions, their freedom, and perhaps even their lives. And that is The Auctioneer, and that is by Joan Sampson. Okay. All right, next up, we have got Come Forth in Thaw, and this is by Jason Robert Ducharme. I have read this book. I highly recommend this book, but I'm going to tell you there are trigger warnings to be associated with this book because the book deals with mental illness and with suicide. So, you know, uh, yeah, just reader beware, all right? Reader beware. The Adrian Forest State Park is one of many beautiful state parks in the White Mountains. It is a popular destination for tourists, painters, hikers, and even weddings. Yet the forest is also a place of great pain and torment and is an equally popular destination to end your own life. The only thing young mother Eleanor Jackson has left in her life is her son Alan, a troubled teenager who has gone to the forest to commit the unthinkable. As Eleanor goes to find him in the forest, she witnesses bizarre and fantastical happenings that try to manipulate and distract her from rescuing her child. When the sun goes down, the specters of the tormented emerge. She will come to discover so much more than just her son. And that is Come Forth in Thaw, and that is by Jason Robert Ducharme. All right. 
Okay, next up we've got a graphic novel, and this is Witches, Volume 1. And this is by Scott Snyder, Matt Hollingsworth, Jock, and Clem Robbins, who I believe would be the writer, penciler, inker, and probably letterer. I'm not sure. All right. Everything you thought you knew about witches is wrong. They are much darker and they are much more horrifying. Witches takes the mythology of witches to a far creepier, bone-chilling place than readers have dared venture before. When the Rooks family moves to the remote town of Litchfield, New Hampshire to escape a haunting trauma, they're hopeful about starting over. But something evil is waiting for them in the woods just beyond town, watching from the trees, ancient and hungry. And that is Witches, Volume 1, by all those people I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, I don't know if there's a Volume 2. I'm going to have to find out if there's actually a Volume 2 to this. I don't know for sure, so I want to find out. Okay, next up we've got The Cabin at the End of the World, and this is by Paul Tremblay. Seven-year-old Wynne and her parents, Eric and Andrew, are vacationing at a remote cabin on a quiet New Hampshire lake. Their closest neighbors are more than two miles in either direction along a rutted dirt road. One afternoon, as Wynne catches grasshoppers in the front yard, a stranger unexpectedly appears in the driveway. Leonard is the largest man Wynne has ever seen, but he is young, friendly, and he wins her over almost instantly. Leonard and Wynne talk and play until Leonard abruptly apologizes and tells Wynne, None of what's going to happen is your fault. Three more strangers then arrive at the cabin carrying unidentifiable, menacing objects. As Wynne sprints inside to warn her parents, Leonard calls out, Your dads don't want, won't want to let us in, Wynne, but they have to. We need your help to save the world. Thus begins an unbearably tense, gripping tale of paranoia, sacrifice, apocalypse, and survival that escalates to a shattering conclusion, one in which the fate of a loving family and quite possibly all of humanity are entwined. The Cabin at the End of the World is a masterpiece of terror and suspense from the fantastically fertile imagination of Paul Tremblay. And that is The Cabin at the End of the World. That's by Paul Tremblay, like I just said. Hey, next up for New Hampshire, we have got Mr. Tender's Girl, and this is by Carter Wilson. At 14, Alice Hill was viciously attacked by two of her classmates and left to die. The teens claimed she was a sacrifice for a man called Mr. Tender, but that could never be true. Mr. Tender doesn't exist. His sinister character is pop culture fiction created by Alice's own father and a series of popular graphic novels. Over a decade later, Alice has changed her name and is trying to heal, but someone is watching her. They know more about Alice than any stranger could. Her scars, her fears, and the secrets she keeps locked away. She can try to escape her past, but Mr. Tender is never far behind. He will come with a smile that seduces and a dark whisper in her ear. Inspired by a true story, this gripping thriller plunges you into a world of haunting memories and unseen threats, leaving you guessing until the harrowing end. And that is Mr. Tender, and that's by Carl, or, excuse me, Carter Wilson. Right. And next up, we have got The Night Strangers, and this is by Chris uh, Bojalian, I believe his name is pronounced. Hope I'm not butchering it too badly. In a dusty corner of a basement in a rambling Victorian house in northern New Hampshire, a door has long been sealed shut with 39 six inch long carriage bolts. The home's new owners are Chip and Emily Linton and their twin 10 year old daughters. Together, they hope to rebuild their lives there after Chip, an airline pilot, has to ditch his 70-seat regional jet in Lake Champlain after double engine failure. Unlike the miracle on the Hudson, however, most of the passengers aboard Flight 1611 die on impact or drown. The body count? 39, a coincidence not lost on Chip when he discovers the number of bolts in that basement door. 
Meanwhile, Emily finds herself wondering about the women in this sparsely populated White Mountain village, self-proclaimed herbalist, and their interest in her fifth grade daughters. Are the women mad, or is it her husband in the wake of the tragedy whose grip on sanity has become desperately tenuous? The result is a poignant and powerful ghost story with all the hallmarks readers have come to expect from best-selling novelist Chris Bojalian. A palpable sense of place, an unerring sense of the demons that drive us, and characters we care about deeply. The difference this time, some of the characters are dead. And that is... Oh, Lord, that is a long, long one there, so let me get back to this. <laughs> oh, man. The Night Strangers, as by Chris Bajalian. All right. Okay, and I think that is going to do it for New Hampshire. Yes. So we're going to move on to New Jersey. I've got three books here for New Jersey. Uh, the first one, and I believe a lot of these, I think two of these actually have to deal with the Jersey Devil. I did not do that on purpose. That is just, the, these are just the books that I found, and they just so happen to do that, all right? Anyway, the first one is The Night Will Find Us, and this is by Matthew Lyons. They say, never go into the woods at night. School's out for summer, and that means one thing to Parker, Chloe, and their four friends. A well-deserved camping trip in the Pine Barrens, a million-acre forest deep in the heart of New Jersey. But when old grudges erupt, an argument escalates into the unthinkable, leaving one of them dead and the killer missing. As darkness descends and those left alive try to determine a course of action, the forest around them begins to change. In the morning, more of the group has vanished and the path that led them into the woods is gone, as if consumed by the forest itself. Lost and hungry, the remaining friends set out to find help, only to realize that the forest seems to have other plans. A darker, ancient horror lies dead and dreaming in a lake in the center of the woods and is calling to them. And that is, the night will find us. What? Wait a minute, I'm not done with that. Sorry, I thought I was done with the synopsis. Meanwhile, deep in the trees, the killer is still at large and one of the group's own has started to transform and warp into something other, something inhuman, something that wants to feast. And that, is The Night Will Find Us by Matthew Lyons. And if you guys will excuse me just one minute, I'm going to pause and I will be right back. All right, folks, I am back. I had somebody meowing at my door, and I thought it was Thomason because she's got a pretty loud meow, but no, it was this little guy right here. This is Boris. Boris has a sister, Natasha, so Boris is going to hang out with me in here while I do this. So the next up we're going to talk about is The Jersey Devil, and this is by Hunter Shea. The legend lives. Everyone knows the legend of the Jersey Devil. Some believe it is an abomination of nature, a hybrid winged beast from hell that stalks the pine barrens of southern New Jersey, searching for prey. Others believe it is a hoax, a campfire story designed to scare children, but one man knows the truth. The devil awakes. Sixty years later, Boompa Willet came face to face with the devil and lived to tell the tale. Now the creature's stomping grounds are alive once again with strange sightings, disappearances, and worse. After all these years, Boompa must return to the barrens not to prove the legend is real, but to wipe it off the face of the earth. The beast must die. It'll take more than just courage to defeat the devil. It will take four generations of the Willick clan, a lifetime of survivalist training, and all the firepower they can carry. But timing is critical. A, music, a summer music festival has attracted crowds of teenagers. The woods are filled with tender young prey, but this time the devil is not alone. The evil has grown in, in, into an unholy horde of mutant monstrosities, and hell has come home to New Jersey. Banding together to survive, the friends soon began to understand the true nature of the horror waiting for them and the Pine Barrens, and that not all of them will make it out alive. And that is The Jersey Devil, and that is by Hunter Shea. All right. Okay, finally for New Jersey, we have got The Chrysalis, and this is by Brendan Deneen. Don't go in the basement. In a brutal spasm of bad luck, Tom and Jenny Deckard lose both their cheap Manhattan apartment and their barely above minimum wage jobs. 
Their luck runs hot when they stumble upon a surprisingly affordable house in the suburbs. An old friend of Tom's offers him an amazing opportunity, and Jenny discovers that she's pregnant. But there are dark secrets galore in the Decker's new, old house. The place has a violent past. There's a thing in the basement, a bizarre chrysalis Tom conceals from Jenny. Touching it makes him feel like a winner, like he can tackle any challenge. The mortgage, the commute, impending fatherhood. Until the night everything goes horribly wrong, and the Decker's dream life is exposed as the phantom it always was. The night the chrysalis starts to hatch. And that is the chrysalis, and that is by Brendan Deneen. Alright? Okay, and finally, we are moving into New Mexico, and we have, first one we got for New Mexico is Illusions, and this is by Brent Monahan. I perform the seemingly impossible because I practice long and hard. There is no such thing as magic. So spoke Frank Spiegel, master of illusion in a shop that shouldn't have existed in a deserted desert town in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico. A missed turn on his way to the big time, Frank knew that his witty stage presence and simple but elegant tricks weren't going to get him to the top. He needed something special and found it in games and magic, an Egyptian sarcophagus that the shopkeeper assured him possessed real magic. His troop, Saunder the equipment manager, Dexter the prop master, driver and mechanic, Bess Frank's assistant, and the troop's mother traveled all as a family, all willing to give up their lives for Frank's dream and the chance to escape their past. Now they were asked by the shopkeeper to part with their most perfect, their most precious illusion to help fulfill that dream. They would learn that magic was very real and that the illusion that each of them most prized was that they had nothing to lose. And on New Year's Eve, the sarcophagus would prove that they were wrong. Dead wrong. And that is Illusions, and that is by Brent Monahan. Okay. Man, my cat, I'm sorry, my cats are just like, just rambunctious today. One of them's over there meowing, I got one here, one me to pet him. Uh, yes, yeah, so they're a little bit rambunctious, I apologize for that. Okay. All right, next up, we have got Little Heaven, and this is by Nick Cutter, who uh, read, who is the uh, author of The Troop, which I read that and really enjoyed it. A trio of mismatched mercenaries, Mika Shuguru, Minerva Atwater, and Ebenezer Elkins, colloquially, colloquially known as the Englishman, is hired by young Ellen Belhaven for a deceptively simple task. Check in on her nephew, who may have been taken against his will, to a remote New Mexico backwoods settlement called Little Heaven, where a clandestine religious cult holds sway. But shortly after they arrive, things begin to turn ominous. There are stirrings in the woods and over the treetops, and above all else, the brooding shape of a monolith known as the Black Rock casts its terrible pall. Paranoia and distrust soon grip the settlement. Escape routes are gradually cut off as events spiral toward madness. Hell, or the closest thing to it, invades little heaven. All present here are now forced to take a stand and fight back. But whatever has cast its dark eye on little heaven is marshalling its power, and it wants them all. And that is Little Heaven, and that is by Nick Cutter. Okay. And finally, for this list of recommendations for New Hampshire, New Jersey, and New Mexico, we have got American Elsewhere, and this is by Robert Jackson Bennett. Some places are too good to be true. Under a pink moon, there's a perfect little town not found on any map, Wink, New Mexico. In that town, there are quiet streets lined with pretty houses, houses that conceal the strangest things. After a couple of years of hard traveling, ex-cop Mona Bright inherits her long-dead mother's home, and the closer Mona gets to her mother's past, the more she understands that the people of Wink are very, very different indeed. And that is, oh my gosh, American Elsewhere, I believe was the title of that. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Yes, American Elsewhere, and that is by Robert Jackson Bennett. Okay. And I've got a very rambunctious cat. Anyway, that is going to do it for New Hampshire, New Mexico, and New Jersey. This uh, uh, edition, or whatever you want to call it, of Horror Across America. So, until next time, take care, and stay scared.
Bye-bye.